We travel back in time for another retro retro episode. Perry Mason has to defend a toupee accused of murder. Hmm, that doesn't sound right. Battle of the Network shows. Join Rick Brooks and Mike Kogel as they explore the TV of the 70s and 80s through hand-picked episodes of their favorite and not-so-favorite series. Welcome to Battle of the Network Shows. I'm Mike. And I'm Rick. Hello, everyone. And today we're going to be doing one of our recent additions to the programming, the look back to the decades before our yes. era. Sort of the Silver Age of television, as if you will. Yes. Or the Silver Fox Age. I don't know what that well, means. Well, that would work in the case of uh, one of the characters <laughs> yes. on the show who we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we uh, looked at the Munsters last season, mm-hmm. and you know we got so many cards and letters. <laughs> I want to dispel a rumor right now, Mike, that the most recent postage increase was not actually due to all the demand and in mail caused by people writing in to tell us, please do more of this. Mm-hmm. I, I'm saying it did not have anything to do with that. Maybe a small bit. There might have been a little bit of that, but don't blame us if you know your stamp is a couple of cents more. But but only on stamps of vintage TV. Yes. Well, there, there, it's a pretty good kind of form of a tax, actually. You know, I'd pay a couple of extra cents for a Hugh O'Brien postage <laughs> stamp. They haven't done him, gotten around to him yet. Mm, no, no. It's like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually. There's only so much room. Yeah, that's true. Some people get lost on the list. That's right. They'll do a whole search. <laughs> yes. Collection. <laughs> Hugh O'Brien. Got a Burgess Doug Meredith. McClure, Burgess Meredith. Yeah, Tony Franciosa. Tony Franciosa. Angel Tompkins. Angel Tompkins. Uh, some Peach Melba. Yeah. And a stale donut. There you go. That would fill up a, a sheet pretty well. Suitable for framing. Yes, I would do my part and buy a, a couple of books of those. This has been Stamp Corner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a new feature. <laughs> Spin-off philatelic uh, podcast. Yes. <laughs> oh, good word. <laughs> Thank you. I hope I said it right. How much did you pay for that one? <laughs> Not as much as the price of a stamp. It's outrageous these days. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to be talking about Perry Mason. Yeah, Perry Mason, a beloved, long-running program, and one that does have a connection to our era of television, but we're going to focus on the original run of Perry Mason. Well, that's right. There's the new... <laughs> Well, there's there's the new Perry Mason. Yes, and then the movies. And then the movies, yeah. There are a lot of movies. As a matter of fact, I know exactly how many movies. There are 26 movies. 20, wow. 26 just with Raymond Burr. And then they made four more after Raymond Burr died. Oh, that's right. And they called them like the Perry Mason Mysteries or something like that. Yeah. And so that's 30 movies after the, the show. And that's on top of 271 episodes of the original Perry Mason. That is a lot of courtroom drama. It sure is. A lot of shenanigans. Yeah, and I think, you know, a lot of people might think, well, where do you start? with a program that has run for 271 episodes in nine seasons. And they're all, I mean, you could argue about maybe the quality of the show maybe being a little bit better in the earlier seasons, but it's it's pretty much the same show start to finish for nine seasons, right? It seems like, yeah, you could just kind of randomly choose yeah, based on titles, which is often now I've been doing it. And I, I would say I've been watching them Maybe for the last year I've been watching them a lot. Sometime after the HBO one. And then uh, you and I both started reading some of the books. Yeah, yeah. The original books. Yeah, yeah and that led me to the, going back to the show. I, I, I think I saw most of the old movies, like the 1930s movies. Oh. With Warren William and a couple of other actors as Perry Mason. Like, And that's kind of cool because that was pretty much around the time like the Earl Stanley Gardner novels were being released. But they are way different than the books. I guess the, the TV show, Earl Stanley Gardner was very much involved in the production of it. You know, at least on a consultant basis and, and quite a bit in the development phase. So they stick a lot more uh, more closely to the source material, whereas those movies just go way off uh, from, you know, the Perry Mason from the books. Yeah, although TV Perry seems a little, a little less roguish than... <laughs> Yeah. The book, Barry. Yeah, I think you and I were both shocked at some of what he does, and especially those early novels that we were yeah. reading. And there's a reference in this episode we're going to talk about today to his reputation and maybe skirting the law a little bit. But right. in some of those early novels, he's he's not just bending the rules. He's, you know, he's taking them out and breaking them over <laughs> his knee you know, and burying them in the backyard. I don't know how many novels there were, but probably like 40 or 50. Yeah, there's tons of them. But yet, as I'm looking through like some of the episodes, it seems like almost every episode happens to be based on a novel. A lot of them, yeah. 
yet there, there's some kind of discrepancy there. I haven't quite figured out. <laughs> I know in later seasons they they started reworking some of the episodes and, and doing they did a few remakes, especially in the last season. But they still had to come up with some original scripts. But it seems like most of the ones I have seen have happened to be based on the novels. I think early in the early years they were relying more heavily on uh, the originals as source material. Yeah, I, I watched a couple after reading the books just to see, you know. And of course they had to change a lot. Yeah, and condense a lot given fifty minutes instead of two hundred pages. Right, but they're fun books. They are. Yeah, they're very well written. And and Earl Stanley Gardner himself was a lawyer, had that background. So he was very concerned with getting the legal details right, more or less. And, and cl- clearly a, like a criminal science buff. Yeah. Like some of the editions I've read had like little intros from him about various stuff like that. Ooh, that's cool. Like, oh, this is inspired by this person and this really <laughs> kind of overly detailed. Yeah. <laughs> And when he gets into that stuff, he does kind of go on. Into the right. weeds a little bit. Yeah, I think I told you one of my favorite things is like Paul Drake will find out some information. He's like, oh, you don't want to, you don't need to know the details. <laughs> Just here's the information. And Perry's like, hey, no, I want to know how you figured it out. And there's like three pages of Paul. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Just expositing. Well, we did this and then did this. and uh. You know who else was a, apparently quite a law buff was Raymond Burr. Really? Yes, he had an extensive legal library of his own and was very interested in like you know the intricacies of the law and and kind of brought that into his work on the show i learned that by the book that my lovely bride Lori got for me uh, called the case of the alliterative attorney a guide to the perry mason tv series and tv movies by bill sullivan with ed robertson and let me tell you folks i'm looking at this book right now that could easily be a volume on a law library show it's a hefty book it's a hefty it's a it's a paperback but it's heavy enough that it would take probably a couple books of search stamps if you were to mail it to somebody (laughs) To make sure it got there, you know? Yeah. But it's it's good. It's got a very comprehensive episode guide and tidbits uh, scattered throughout the book. It, it's But it has a lot of information, and it was a v- very good resource. And it draws on a lot of other previous sources as well, and some interviews and the extensive interviews with Arthur Marks, who was a producer on the show, and also gave a lot of comments on the 50th anniversary DVD set, which I watched some of those a while ago. And that was some of my first exposure on a regular basis to Perry Mason, because I didn't really watch the show at all growing up. I remember T. CBS having commercials for it. But other than that, I don't think it was on a lot in syndication that I remember, at least not times I was aware of it. So I didn't watch it at all as a kid. I might have mentioned this on our TBS episode, but there was a summer where they started showing those. Or, or maybe they were showing them every summer, but I remember a specific summer. Like it was on like around lunchtime. Mm-hmm. Kind of like I think I mentioned Columbo was on a different channel, but and that was like the summer of Perry Mason. Yeah. My brother and I were watching it every day. And I can I can just hear that that TBS voice every guy. The summer of Perry yes. Mason. <laughs> TBS at 12.05. Hey, kids, you're home from school all summer. (laughs) What's better than middle-aged men? Oh, that sounds pretty sinister. (laughs) In the courtrooms. (laughs) Doing legal work. Yeah. Don't look up Bill Tallman's. (laughs) extracurricular activities what better way to spend your your summer vacation perry mason followed by gilligan's island of course of course (laughs) only on the super station yeah (laughs) summertime fun and i feel like we were old enough that like we caught on to the patterns of it pretty quickly well it's it's highly highly formulaic show Mm mm-hmm but, you know, there's nothing wrong with formula if it's well done. And I think this is a good lesson in that. Yeah. And it's kind of refreshing. Really, we've talked about this, I think, on the podcast before. Like, now everything seems to be serialized. So it's kind of nice to be able to go to something that maybe it has, you know, 271 episodes, but you can pick any episode and kind of jump right in. Yeah. That, that's kind of cool. Right. Yeah. I think the only ones that maybe have whatever vague continuity are those ones where Raymond Burrow is in the hospital. Yeah. But I don't even think they say why he's not directly, the character is not directly involved in things, do they? Right. I think he's. They just show him. He like phones in from his like hospital bed or whatever his sick bed. But that's right. One of them he's in the hospital, but others he's at home with his his own law library. Yeah. When Hugh O'Brien visits that's right, him yeah. in his bathrobe and <laughs> whatever his rich man's right, pajamas. But I mean, I th- I think that maybe is a good place, or, or that's kind of a natural place to start. And I think that anniversary DVD set I mentioned, the whole series is out on DVD. It came out very slowly and half season sets but there's also that 50th anniversary sort of best of set and one thing they did was they selected some of the most notorious episodes episodes that were notable for being different Mm. for example like perry sort of loses a case or you know something else happens to to get out of that formula it's it's very notable notable because it so rarely happens and that's kind of what i think i was looking for like oh this sounds interesting because it's not it's unique from the other episodes but i mean there's just a lot of episodes you can just go through and like okay this has a cool guest star or you know like you said the title sounds interesting 
interesting, something like that. It's kind of just, it's cool to dig in that way too. Yeah. And you do, you know what you're going to get, but you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. Like, you know, you could get one of those surprising episodes or it's surprising in the, you know, there was one I watched that like the, the direction was just really ambitious and kind of noirish and different. Yeah. With, it had a lot, of, a lot of like whip pans and things that yeah. <laughs> you, you don't usually see on there. And like, oh, that's cool. I mean, you, you just use the word noirish and some episodes sort of do have that air about them. I mean, it's it's like I find it a very like humorous show mm-hmm. for reasons that, you know, we'll get into, I think. But just a lot of it, like the black and white. And it's it's a very well produced show, too. Yes. The cinematography and the direction are, are usually top notch in the editing as well. So it just I think that's why it holds up uh, today. Part of it is just because it's just a, such a quality, well produced TV show. Yeah, I agree. And yeah. a first rate cast. Yeah. Yeah. The acting is, is almost uniformly excellent. The regular cast is great and they get so many like good character actors and bring them on and just let them do their thing and you know they'll they'll shine for a few minutes sometimes it's just like one scene but they a lot of times they make an impression and again the episode we're going to talk about today that it's a great example of that there's a few people that maybe they're not there but they're either recognizable and or they just leave a, a great impression in limited screen time and that's a mark of a really good show that's that's really hitting it when when you can do that you can have other people come in they don't upstage the main cast but it's the casting is going well the direction and of course the writing in addition to just having colorful actors themselves yeah all held down by great raymond burr (laughs) (laughs) and he is he's great in this role he really is you know and then i mean i've seen him in a few of those like a few movies like pitfall he's great in that Mm -hmm. as a heavy Mm -hmm. i don't know how good he is in godzilla but you know of course rear window that's his other famous one well, I guess he really went after this role hard, partly because he, he saw it as his way, way to get out of playing the bad guys, and he really embraced the role, and it became very important to him. And he, from this book and other accounts, it seems like he was very uh, well-liked on the set. Like, he used his influence to help the show, but it was always in service of the show. It seemed like he was a, a pretty selfless actor. He was generous to you know his co-stars. He had a good sense of humor. He liked uh, doing practical jokes, but everybody liked him. I mean, and he could have, he was the whole show. And, and that's one thing we sort of briefly mentioned the new Perry Mason, which came out in 1973. One of the problems with that was that the old Perry Mason had been off the air like maybe seven or eight years, and it was still playing in reruns at that time. In some markets, two different stations had it. So how could you possibly compete with it? And, you know, Monty Markham was Perry Mason. He's a good actor, but people just weren't ready to accept another actor. Right. Now, the HBO series, that's taking a totally different approach, right? Yeah. At least the first season was was almost like the, the secret origin of Perry Mason. So he's not even a lawyer for most of it. Wow. He's a, he's a private eye and kind of a very, ch- it's HBO, it's the 21st century, so he's trouble. Of course, yeah. He's a World War One vet, so he has some issues from that. And it is very, it's very noirish. And, but it's good. I, I, I think a criticism I saw leveled at it, and I understand, is like, well, why does it have to be Perry Mason? Why didn't you just make a cool noir show? Yeah. But I imagine, you know, I know it started with Robert Downey Jr.'s company, and they had the rights to Perry Mason, and then it just, I'm sure the process wasn't, we have this cool noir idea, mm-hmm. let's call it Perry Mason. Right. It was like, we have Perry Mason, let's do something with it, and it became this idea. I have to wonder, would HBO be interested in just doing like a procedural, like a more straightforward procedural, like, you know, Perry Mason is... Right, like this was a one case over the course of the whole season, mm-hmm. more or less, so I, I'm guessing not. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows, They might that might be like their next... Uh, their next turn. Yeah. It's not it's not HBO, it's it's old TV. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, like, a good comparison today would be, like, Law & Order or something, right? Or the, yeah. the Dick Wolf shows. Law & Order, maybe that one in particular because you have two halves of the show, and a lot of times Perry Mason will have the beginning and then the courtroom taking up maybe the second half of the uh, the episode. Right. Not as much police work. No. Police are involved, but... Yeah. <laughs> Mostly chasing bad leads. But, you know, I, I mean, I like the HBO show. Mm-hmm. Again, I, I don't know. It's probably an apples and oranges comparison. Yeah. But if you like crime dramas, then you'll probably... I'll, I'll have to check it out sometime. And I think I, I could go in there thinking, okay, this is a different Perry Mason. Just like I enjoy this Perry Mason, but I also enjoy watching those Warren William 1930s movies, even though part of it's like, wow, this is totally different than, than I was expecting. But they're still entertaining in their own right. You know, I'm not Earl Stanley Gardner. I don't have any... <laughs> I don't have to be outraged... Uh, <laughs> At the portrayal of the character or what they're doing with anything, so. And I guess maybe Downey was originally going to play him. That would have been interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think he would have been good. Yeah. Definitely a, a slicker. Yeah. <laughs> version that Matthew Reese is playing. Yeah. You know, that, yeah, of course it would have been fun. He did a courtroom drama, that thing with Robert Duvall. That's right, yeah. Here comes to judge. Wait, what was that? <laughs> I don't know what that was called. <laughs> I think. Um, let's win an Oscar. That's what that was called, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah let's win an Oscar. <laughs> yeah. 
Speaking of awards, you know, I was thinking Perry Mason did win three Emmys, I think. Raymond Burr won one. I think Barbara Hale won one as Della Street. But the show, it was very popular in its day. And I think it was respected, it seemed like, uh, critically. And it seems like the kind of show that it's not necessarily thought of in the same way as some other great shows are. But it's tough to find people that have, like, a lot of bad things to say about it, if that makes sense. It's kind of like a, a solid middle brow kind of, like, just quality show that it does one thing. It doesn't veer too much out of its lane, but it does it very well. And it did it for so long that you know it's 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 respected and it does find its way i guess on some best of lists mm-hmm. i bet there are lawyers <laughs> Yeah. Complain about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess like I think some police and, and people, you know, on that side of the law yeah. thought that complain for a while that the show made them look bad. It's a fair but, complaint. Yeah. And I think in the book, I think Ed Robertson makes the point that like, well, on the other hand, you could say that Perry Mason does a great job for Hamilton Burger because he gives him an airtight case by the end of every episode of like who the real killer is. Which I think I saw a quote of or Bill Tallman saying a similar thing. That, yeah. Like that. I mean, this is just on Wikipedia, but, you know, Burger never lost, really. Yeah. And in, in the end, it's a win. You're right. He gets the guy eventually. He gets the guy, yeah. I mean, he loses to Perry Mason, in a manner of speaking. Yes. And reminded of another quote that somebody, I guess somebody said to him, like Raymond Burr one time, like, you never lose a case, you know, and, and he said, I'm sure with a twinkle in his eye, <laughs> uh, but ma'am, you only see the cases I do on Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of a, a thing to think about. Actually, I've thought about that before. Is like he spends so much time on like each individual case, and every now and then you see like references to him working on other things. Like I think in the books, right? They they will get into that too. Like he'll he'll put things aside or make passing references to other things he's doing. Yeah. But on the TV show, you see him focus on one thing and expending a lot of resources and energy, and you know, and a lot of Paul Drake's time and energy. Yeah. On doing things for just one case at a time. You must pay Paul Drake well. Yeah. <laughs> Because especially in the books, he's like never stops working. But he's got operatives everywhere, too. Yes, yes. That's right. He's got like his own agency. Yeah. But as some kind of retainer with Mason or whatever. Right. So he's always on call for him. Yeah. So that's an interesting relationship there. It is. And and on the show, a lot of times, they'll be like sitting down to eat. And then yeah, right as Paul's about to eat something, he has to run off to yeah. do it. Like, oh. Yeah, poor guy. Yeah. He's very put upon in a way. Yeah, it, you know, he's the one that you see seems to like. You sort of feel the lack of a personal life from him, like because he would actually want one. Yeah. Whereas Perry Mason, it seems like he's content to just do this, you know, and every now and then just like you know, get in his robe and his, spend time in his law library with a with a brandy or something like that. But yeah. other than that, you know, he's fine. Yep. <laughs> Uh, going back to Hamilton Burger for a second, I, I didn't dawn on me until today thinking about an email you had sent me a couple days ago referring to him as Hamburger. <laughs> yeah. That his name is Hamburger. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. And Mason eats him for lunch in yes. practically every case. <laughs> I think, if I'm not mistaken, the episode that we're going to talk about today, the source novel for that was actually the first appearance of Hamilton Burger oh. in the novels. Wow. Yes. I didn't realize this one had a source novel. And the source novel has a completely different title, and one of the central premises of it is totally different, which, you know, oh, okay. we'll get into, but yeah. William Tallman is like, a, a, he's another <laughs> character as a kid who had go away heat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because he is always, he's just, you know, he's cranky. Yeah. Understandably. And he had played some real scoundrels in movies, too, before the show. You could see him just being kind of a, yeah, cranky is a good way of putting it, actually. And sometimes he gets, in those courtroom scenes, he just gets really, really aggressive. He does. And he, he seems, I mean, the character seems to always be, like, kind of in the best interest of the law. But one of his equal considerations a lot of times seems to be getting the best of Perry Mason. Yes. I mean, let's face it. And, and they have a fascinating relationship. Like, this is sort of their, I mean, it's, I guess it's sort of cat and mouse, but it, it's its like, you know, that seems a little too, you know, equal uh, somehow. He's definitely the Tom. Yeah. <laughs> in that situation. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think, and he, he he is he's got a lot of hubris, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which Mason is always taking advantage of. Yeah, like he's oh he thinks he's got this case, and he always walks right into a trap, and then yeah, my favorite ones involve Mason somehow accidentally convincing everyone that they should go on it, or getting Burger to to decide that they should go to like some location, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then it always just. <laughs> Totally yeah. <laughs> reveals the flaws in the case and usually the, the killer. I, I think that's part of the genius of it a lot of times is he gets, he manages to find a way to get Berger to do things that are in Perry's best interest. Yes. Like he doesn't even have to do it a lot of times. Right. It's an interesting, it, Perry seems more bemused by things, mm-hmm. you know, and just willing to, to go with the flow, whereas Berger seems to get like annoyed. But, you know, usually at the end of the case, a lot of times he doesn't seem to hold a big grudge against him. I guess they reset it. And then, you know, there's Trag. Trag and he and Mason have their own relationship relationship 
And that seems a little bit more just kind of like a friendly rivalry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what's that guy's name again? Ray Collins. Ray Collins. The great right. Ray Collins. Yes, from Mercury Theater. He's old school. Yeah, Citizen Kane. Old school. And in fact, he was originally seen as too old to play the part, but they cast him anyway. And unfortunately, in some of the later seasons, he's not in there, you know, for health reasons. He had to kind of retire from the show. Yeah, he does seem awfully old. But, yeah, uh, which probably means he's like 56 or something. Yeah, I think he, well, yeah, I think he was like 67 when he was cast. Okay. And I think partly out of loyalty to him, they kept him in the credits long after he had been in the show, just kind of out of loyalty to him. And that was something that I think Raymond Burr had a lot of influence on, too. So, yeah, I talk about hubris. He always, always, is like, yep, we've got him. Yeah, yeah. And he's, he's usually got a big grin. Yes, he does. Like this one, he walks into the office, like, hey, 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 here yeah. we go. Yeah, and then <laughs> it, it's more of a playful yeah. relationship between those two, though. Whereas Mason and Berger really seem like antagonists a lot of the time. And then after Ray Collins, they had Anderson, I think, Lieutenant Anderson, who was Wesley Lau, and I, I've seen him a little bit, and he, he just doesn't stand out as much. It was kind of a more of a thankless role, and they didn't give him as, as much to do. And then Richard Anderson took that role, I think, in the last season. Richard Anderson, yes, Richard Anderson from later from the Six Million Dollar Man. See, he he could have made a good maybe Perry Mason or Hamilton Berger. Yeah, in the the new Perry Mason, the one that I saw. Harry Gardino played Hamilton Berger, and I thought he was great. He was very, like, into it. He had a nice early 70s mustache that added some flavor to the character. So, yeah, I mean, the acting was good in that. It just wasn't quite the same. And after watching all these, I mean, that is one thing. I can I could watch, like, a modern Perry Mason, but it, it took took a while to, to see seeing the show in color. In 1970s color was a little bit of a, a big difference. I think maybe, like, one episode of the original Perry Mason was in Technicolor, maybe. But it just seemed, feels like a black and white show. And then we've got William Hopper as Paul Drake. Great. He, he liked like, seems exactly like the Drake from the books. Yeah. Like, put upon, as we said, but he lounges about in the chairs, which Gardner always takes a lot of pride in describing that in the books. <laughs> Because, of course, the book's always reset, too. So he's always got to reintroduce some of these ideas. Yeah. Drake's always taking his customary position with his leg draped over the armrest. <laughs> <laughs> on the TV show, he's always got a cigarette, too. Yes. There's a lot of smoking on this show, but oh, man. Paul Drake seems to be the, the king of all the smokers. Yeah. And he's always calling Della sweetheart or something. Or gorgeous. Yeah. So uh, which couple do you ship? Do you ship Della and Paul or Della and Perry? I like Della and Paul better. Yeah. Now, on the HBO one, Della plays for a different team. Ah. And so does Hamilton Burger. Hmm. Can't ship. I guess you could ship Hamilton Burger and Perry Mason or something. Yes. <laughs> Well, of course, in real life, uh, Raymond Burr was a confirmed bachelor mm -hmm. his whole life with a few marriages and made up marriages and things. He, he was, but you know, he, he was closeted, just sort of an interesting, interesting part of his, his life. I mean, he didn't, the character Perry Mason, you don't, you don't really see anything, but he had this fascinating sort of behind the scenes life. You know, he had struggles with his weight, which you can actually see like just in the difference between the episode today and some of those later episodes and like the early episodes, he, he lost a lot of weight, I think, for the first season. Yeah. And, like seeing him in Pitfall is kind of like stunning how big he is yeah yeah even though i you know i remember seeing him in those the movies and you know where he was a larger man again yeah and it, it just just kind of like he acts big too i yes. mean and not in a totally like over the top way but he has the, a presence about him which is appropriate yeah and he, he carries himself like like a big shot lawyer and well he should because he's, he's pretty good at it yeah <laughs> The actor and the character. Yeah, and I and I want to give a the I th I think as a kid, you know, Della didn't maybe make an impression on me, but she's actually w one a lot more important to the stories than I realized. Mm -hmm. And two, Barbara Hale is really good at. She's just got a right the right uh, sort of attitude about all this. Like she looks a little as askance at things and <laughs> right makes a little asides. And but also is is she's not first of all what do they call it? is not just secretary he has a very specific name for her because anything he says is considered he can say in front of her. Yeah, that's right. Like his confidential secretary. <laughs> I like that. And they have like a receptionist out that like she's on she doesn't answer the phones. She makes phone calls for him. But she... Yeah, I didn't understand that for a while, like why Della's always like running around doing other stuff. But but there's actually again, and he's got a huge office. Yeah. I mean just his own like quarters are huge. Yeah. But there's like a whole other like waiting area outside. Right. And then there's the whole door system that yeah. the, the books get into, but it's it's in the show. But it's a lot easier to just show it in the show but then the books it's like a, a paragraph describing yeah there's like the one a, door you come in another door you go out perry has a private door that only della perry and paul yeah have the have access to <laughs> and he's got to have his own bathroom in his uh, oh, office i think too. i'm sure yeah that's that's the secondary law library yeah <laughs> i'll be i'll be studying some cases some yeah. precedent <laughs> uncle john's uh legal bathroom reader <laughs> 
but she's great. She is, yeah, and vital, a vital part of the team. And that's one good thing about the show is it really does feel like a team. Drake, his role may change a little bit from episode to episode, but Della is, is almost always there with Perry and, and, and does seem important and, you know, treated more or less as an equal. Uh, it wouldn't have to be. And that's kind of one reason why I don't like the idea of thinking them as, as romantic because it's still kind of a boss. But you know what? It, it's it's tough to think of the, the firm. I, I have to think that she's very, very well compensated for what she does. Yeah, I think so. You know, it's, it's not it's not a strict, ordinary relationship in that, that case as a legal secretary, you know. And, and in the movies, the later movies, not the 1930s ones, but the TV movies, they do become romantic, right? I think they do, or at least they have, I think it's more implied still, but I don't know how explicit they are, but it's it's become more clear, like, you know, that they are a couple, but I, I still don't think they, they really got into that much. And that's another thing, I never really watched the TV movies. I remember there being commercials. Yeah, I watched them a lot because that was around the same time I was watching the show. Okay, and that's NBC was showing those. Yeah, and just an aside, people forget that before Robert Stack, he hosted Unsolved Mysteries. Ah. When it was just like specials, which was around the same time too. Yeah, Raymond Burr had one heck of a career because again, he had Ironside was on like eight, seven or eight seasons, I think, after Perry Mason, and that's a pretty good run. And then, of course, that other show. <laughs> Kingston Confidential. Kingston Confidential, yeah. Yeah, Kingston Confidential didn't have quite as long a run as some of these <laughs> other shows, but that, that's one I do want to see. But so, well, I think we're, we're sort of answering if anybody had a question, why did Raymond Burr come back and do 20-some Perry Mason movies? Well, we're, we're kind of answering. He had some misfires in there. And Fred Silverman, I think, was the one that, that had the idea to, to do this after, like, Matt Locke was successful. I think that was kind of helped influence. Golden the, gut. Yeah. Fully recovered by the time. Yes. <laughs> Very focused on older actors doing crime shows. That's right. You know, sometimes a golden gut just has a taste for one kind of food. <laughs> yeah, and we'll indulge it to the fullest extent. Yeah, but with good results sometimes. But yeah, I didn't. I didn't watch those TV movies either. They they seemed kind of weird to me. Like I knew that it was they were you know an, an existing old franchise, but it, it did seem kind of weird. Just kind of like the whole everybody being so much older, and you know, as a kid, I didn't quite get into that, and it wasn't just wasn't my kind of show at the time. Right. So I haven't really seen any of those TV movies. And he had different adversaries in those. Mm. William Tallman had passed away, right? Yeah. And, and William Hopper had, so William Cat played the P.I. role. That's right, yeah. Who I think is Drake's son. In the show, he's he's his son, but in real life, he's Barbara yeah. Hale's son. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, being the 1980s, Perry fought, you know, commies and, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, troubled Vietnam vets and yeah. <laughs> aliens from outer space. Yeah. It was the 1980s, you know, they rolled with it. You are from Mars, are you not? <laughs> That's something he didn't really do in this episode. No. He, he didn't use the thing we like, the did, the, you, did not. you not line of questioning. <laughs> Extremely effective. Any good defense attorney will tell you that, that that's a good way to, to really get at the truth. Yeah, because the person is trying to parse what that means. <laughs> that's right. Did I? <laughs> yeah. Did I not? So they, they really have to concentrate <laughs> on what actually happened rather than elaborate wordplay. No, I didn't. Wait. <laughs> I did. Aha. Uh. <laughs> uh -huh. So, let's go get into this episode. Yeah, I think we should. Chosen at the last minute. As we said, you know, uh, since they're kind of interchangeable, we didn't have as much debate about, oh, this or that. Yeah, Paul Drake came barreling into our podcast studio. Yes. Here at BOTNS West, where we are right now, and gave us an envelope that had the episode that we should do. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and we looked down at it, smiled, and went with it. Be before we say that, one gripe, because uh, most of this is streaming on various platforms, on on Freebie, formerly IMDb TV, and Paramount Plus. Sundance also shows it, I think. So I think they're, some of them are on AMC Plus, maybe. Hmm. But there's at least one episode that's missing from all of those, which is one in which Paul Drake is accused of murder. Of all the episodes I want to see, that's yeah. the episode I want to see the most. Yeah, talk about a distinctive episode. Yeah. And Perry has to defend him. Right. Like, I don't even know why it's missing. That's no. the only one that I've noticed is missing. Yeah. And at least for a while, it was on some, on Philo, I think. Some. Oh, wow. Philo or one of the sort of lesser things. Yeah, and maybe because it because like Sundance shows reruns of it, maybe it showed up like on demand. Yeah, maybe it's it's still in syndication package, but not on streaming. Why? I mean, does does Paul sing Jailhouse Rock in the episode or something? Right. I couldn't clear it. <laughs> I, I don't know, but yeah, I would like to see that one too. So and yeah, I could have gotten you know a free trial of whatever the streaming thing it was, and I did, and now it's not li even listed on Amazon mm. as exists. You know, as you said, like the episodes just skip. Like before Prime was showing, oh, you could watch it through this. I suspect those Sundance ones are edited too, and like MeTV has been showing that for years too. And I don't know if they time compress or edit, but I know like that syndication and Hallmark was editing these, and I, I was looking at lists of some of the edits. And man, can you imagine? There's not a lot of wasted space in these shows. I guess there's 
stuff they could trim, but some of the, the plots are pretty intricate yeah. that I'd really prefer to watch it uncut. I watched one on MeTV that some scene was missing, mm. and it just it didn't make any sense because uh, that scene was missing. That's a shame. That yeah. didn't happen. What? Yeah. what did you see this person sneaking around or whatever it was? Right. And like I kind of went back and was scanning through now. Ugh, it's too bad. That was before I knew I could watch it other places. Right. So this one, it's, I, w- I was watching a different show on Freebie, and it got to the end, and it just auto-played this episode with the title, The Case of the Treacherous Toupee. And regular li- listeners will know that's going to pique my interest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I started watching it, and then one of the actors we'll mention uh, later showed up, and I was like, oh, that's intriguing. And I mentioned it to you in the email, and you had just watched it. Yeah. Uh, and said it was actually a good one to do. Yeah, I think there's a lot interesting to talk about. I sure hope so, because we <laughs> were going to talk about it uh, today. But yeah, and this was originally, the, the novel was called The Case of the Counterfeit Eye. So so the central the central premise revolved around a glass eye instead of a toupee. Yeah. However, they thought, well, it was too gruesome, I think, was the <laughs> word that... Uh, I think Barbara Hale actually said, so they changed it considerably. All right, to find someone clutching a glass eye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they could have gotten, gotten Peter Falk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or Sammy Davis Jr. Yes, they're both, yeah. <laughs> So this actually opened the fourth season of Perry Mason. But would you be interested in knowing what else was on that night when this premiered, Mike? Yeah. I don't even know if I will know these shows. but Well, a little bit of yes and a little bit of no, maybe. But premiered September 17th, 1960, Saturday night on CBS. And it was a Saturday night show for its first five seasons before it moved. And I think that kind of hurt the ratings a little bit. But it did very well as a 7.30 p.m. show on Saturday nights. And now, in this particular night, on CBS, it was Perry Mason at 7.30. Now, what was interesting was in the TV listings I looked, at in two different newspapers they called it a repeat but every other source indicates it's the and every all the other evidence indicates it did lead off the fourth season and it's like on the dvd sets it's the fourth season so i don't know why they get the repeat from it, very unusual trag gave them that information that, that's quite possible they got some bad uh, <laughs> intel <laughs> a, a lead that, that was promising but it turned sour yeah. because i actually checked like the next week they're li- in the papers they're they're noting season premieres of, of different shows and everything so so anyways after perry mason cbs had checkmate at 8 30 detective show with uh, Sebastian Cabot and uh, Doug McClure, I think. 9.30, Have Gun, Will Travel, Half Hour Western, and then 10 o'clock, Gunsmoke, which was still in the half hour days. And uh, it looked to me like 10.30 was kind of a local slot at that point because I looked at like the New York and Los Angeles papers and was Sea Hunt, which was syndicated, and White Heat, I think, in Los Angeles. So White Heat, the TV series. White Heat, the movie, actually, with <laughs> yeah. Jimmy Cagney, yes. <laughs> Every week, he shoves a different piece of fruit in somebody's face. <laughs> So ABC had Campaign Roundup at 7.30, public affairs program. Uh, this was an election year, and a pretty big election year, the 1960 election. Oh. Then at 8 o'clock, something called John Gunther's High John Gunther's High Road. <laughs> and this is an episode about like some nature, wildlife kind of thing. I, I'd never heard of this show before. 8.30, Leave it to Beaver. 9 o'clock, Lawrence Welk. And then 10 o'clock, it looked like uh, How to Marry a Millionaire, which was a, a sitcom. I think this is probably a rerun. I think this might have been another local slot. Barbara Eden was on that show, adaptation of the movie. And at 10 30 something called the circle a variety show and again I, I think that was not a network thing i think it was local programming then nbc had bonanza at 7 30 followed by 8 30 the tall man another half hour western with it was a billy the kid western with clue gulliger and barry sullivan i think played pat garrett and i think clue gulliger was billy the kid at nine o'clock the deputy which had henry fonda and at 9 30 something called the campaign and the candidates another public affairs thing and then 10 30 again local programming i had found the man from interpol which is a, i think a syndicated espionage show so so really Perry Mason going up against Bonanza was uh, kind of the big show down here. The ABC schedule just sounds bizarre. Yeah, there's no flow to it at all. No. Again, this is kind of like a classic example of three network days and, and just trying to get like the widest possible audience and not worrying about like audience flow as much. Leave it to Beaver into Lawrence Welk. Yeah. Which later I could see people using both of those as, as shorthand for sort of naive 1950s life. Right. Oh, yeah. Just pairing them just seems because yeah. after a nature show. and a... Yeah. And this is kind of an interesting time. I mean, 1960, so it's literally kind of straddling two decades, right? But you get sort of the tail end of the Western craze. I mentioned a bunch of Westerns that were on. And also, you know, you've got the John F. Kennedy about to be elected right. in the, a presidential election that was going through. So really kind of a kind of an interesting thing. And Perry was kind of like 1957 to 1966. So Perry went well into the, the actual 1960s. Yes, and yet pretty much stayed the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they ever had any little well, 66 that would still be pre-hippie, but yeah, any early psychedelia. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> Perry and Paul sitting back and listening to Revolver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Perry's sending Paul down to the local uh, record shop to fetch him a, a new copy of Revolver. <laughs> right, yeah. 
Yeah, I kind of see Perry Mason as a very early 60s show, if anything. Yeah. <laughs> 1950s, early 60s seems just about right for Perry. But I bet he enjoyed Camelot. Yeah. The brief Camelot period. <laughs> I would like to see Perry Mason get put on the JFK assassination. Oh, we would know who did it. We would. <laughs> There'd be no doubt about that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, if, if Lee Harvey Oswald had had gone to trial with Perry Mason, not only would we know the fate of Oswald, we would know the whole extent of whatever happened. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't just be about getting, you know, getting Oswald off. Right. He'd get to the bottom of this. Yeah. No matter how deep it went. Yes. <laughs> you know, I can imagine Paul Drake, you know, complaining about, I've, I've been, made so many trips back and forth to Dallas that uh, <laughs> I've gone through five 10-gallon hats. <laughs> So this episode begins with a Pan Am plane landing at an airport. And a man gets off and he stops at a payphone and calls a house and gets a housekeeper there and asks for a Mrs. Bassett. And she explains that she's not there because she's on the way downtown to some sort of sharecroppers meeting. He starts to chuckle and then he gets an angry look on his face and hangs up. And he rifles through the phone book and calls this company called, well, the name has changed. <laughs> he wants Bassett Tool and Die, but the name has changed. Yeah, and this guy playing Bassett. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we haven't found out who he is yet. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm sorry for spoiling his That's name. That's okay. Hart- Hartley Bassett. Yes. Thomas Brown Henry was a character actor that has very distinctive features. And it was in a lot of things. He, a lot of times he played like authority figures or maybe on both sides of the law. I think in a couple of like old science fiction movies, like 20 Million Miles to Earth, he would be like a military general or something like this. But he's very good in this. Yeah. He's he's really kind of a, an unsavory type uh, <laughs> yes, person. Yes, But he's good at, at registering like annoyance and, and arrogance even and all those things. So I, I really enjoy enjoyed his performance yeah so he wants to talk to a guy named peter dawson who he's surprised to learn is now president of the company and he asks if there's a, a shareholders meeting going on and the receptionist is like well i wouldn't know about that so later in the same office we meet sybil bassett and peter dawson and she has brought her husband's proxy and he's been missing or, or gone he had deserted her two years ago and she's a little worried is she gonna make is she making the right choice and dawson is encouraging her and saying he he sent her son richard away because he was distracting her from making the choice on her own and then they they start this meeting and, and they're gonna sell off all the assets of this company to a new company and then everyone who's in the meeting will be part of the new company it's it's to get the missing husband sort of affairs out of out of this tool and die company so they can make their own tool and die. Company. Yeah, they make bearings. Yeah, bearings. Tool and die, a very vital part of our nation's industry. So um, I'm glad that they're going forward with this and keeping things moving. And and as the, they're in the middle of this meeting, Hartley Bassett bursts in and Sybil faints. And I think maybe we we'll go to the credits then. I'm not sure. Why don't we mention the uh, the opening sequence with the the Great Park Avenue beat by Fred Steiner as the theme song. Such a good song. It, it just really is an awesome song. I mean, it's it's you know a pure instrumental and just kind of has that that cool mood it, it makes you think like okay this is like it's it's urbane but you know a hint of danger it's very well done yeah that's one of those ones you never skip the intro yeah just for the song and and uh, yeah this is a shorter version where perry's just holding a file and, but there's a longer version that i really enjoy where he carries the file from the judge to each of the cast members and yeah they all have interesting looks on their faces and, and perry has a nice confident grin when he sees the file yeah like it confirms exactly what he yes it's not a surprise to him yeah he, he's very pleased with it the contents of like, said file. like he's just eating some cheese yes yes <laughs> and and and, and ray collins is like because he's old yeah he's like smacking his lips a lot like, <laughs> i mean you can't hear it but he, he, he just that's an interesting thing to see yes <laughs> I'm glad you, you pointed that out. Yes. Yeah. Well. So later, we're at, at the Bassett home, and Hartley is kind of lording over her, over Sybil. And again, like you said, that he's very good at playing this really arrogant sort of bully and just filling the room with his, his sort of meanness. Yeah, and uh, what I love about this scene is that, you know, he's kind of acting like he's really like on the uh, offensive against her and he never explains you know just what it is what just what the heck he did where he's been and why he's back he doesn't bother explaining any of it no he just is and he's gonna stop whatever they're doing he's yeah he's yoga and he thinks you know she wants to be with dawson which does seem like that's probably the case he makes reference to richard being greedy and no good dawson then said some unflattering things about him too so already getting this impression of this kid is no good and so richard is is his stepson no relation to me by the way correct richard hart and she's she's sort of apologetic she's like oh i you know i wouldn't have done this but you know the company was almost bankrupt when you left and and dawson got it back in shape and 
she mentions, you know, like $6,000 disappeared when he left. And, and he does, he seems surprised about that. He also says to her at one point, don't pretend to be any stupider than you already are. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Talk about turning some words around. Yeah. Odds don't seem good for a pleasant reconciliation at this point. No, especially when she says she hates him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's sort of, I don't want to say a weak. She is fighting back here a little bit, but she's definitely uh, a little fragile or something. Yeah. So her saying that, you know, takes a lot of energy. Didn't she, like, faint at the meeting when uh, yeah. yeah, when he barged in? After he leaves, once he hears about that $6,000, she calls San Francisco where Richard is, and he's played by one Robert Redford. An instantly recognizable Robert Redford. Yeah, the one and only yes. Robert Redford. That's right. But not quite the Robert Redford we would see later. No. Lacking a certain amount of gravitas uh, yes like the robert redford of even 10 years later yeah it, it's it's like if robert redford were playing luke skywalker <laughs> that's good you know who he kind of reminded me of physically especially in this first scene i kind of thought he looks like a little older dennis the menace a little bit <laughs> just physically but overall i like the luke skywalker uh, dennis the menace the tv character or yeah dennis the like the tv dennis the menace he, he, i could see him like in a an young adult dennis the menace series <laughs> <laughs> just think how film history would have been changed if Redford would have gotten that that role and you know done like five years as Dennis the Menace in the 60s the all new Dennis the Menace <laughs> <laughs> Dennis uh, constantly overhearing people say mean things at work and then yeah. blurting them out <laughs> still annoying Mr. Wilson because yep. he's sleeping on his couch now <laughs> But he, yeah, and he's, he seems like he's maybe a little bit of a cad. He does. At least early on. Later, it doesn't seem as much. Especially that first call with his mom. Yeah. We see, like, his point of view, and just everything about him looks suspicious in the way he's saying things. Kind of confirms what uh, all these other people have been saying yeah. about him. Yeah, I mean, he's asking about money. And she's clearly upset, and he just doesn't care. Also, he, he just got married and walked in late. You know, they just walked in the bedroom. So he's got other things on his mind. Right, yeah. He chides his mom for, you know, I think several times in that conversation. Yeah, until she finally, you know, tells him what's going on. Yeah, that gets his attention when he finds out that the stepdad is back in the picture. He doesn't like his stepdad. No. Yeah, and she had said, you know, when it rains, it pours. And then at the end, he's, I'll make it rain, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make it pour on him. <laughs> then it'll be wet. Yeah. It'll be uncomfortable until he gets dried off. <laughs> Maybe he'll catch a cold. <laughs> That'll show him. Yeah. And back in L.A., we have Dawson in the office, and Ken Woodman from The Plant arrives. He seems like a surly guy. I really like this guy. This is Bert Freed, who is in tons of things in this time. I think he was the first screen Columbo, actually. <laughs> in a, and he went to the Pennsylvania State University. So oh, well, there you go. Fellow Penn Stater, a little shout there. But he's great in this episode. Yeah. And, yes, very dyspeptic. <laughs> Toward everyone. <laughs> And Dawson tells him, well, if, with Bassett around, you're, he, he had some plans to make some changes in the plant. Like, he, he's the plant supervisor, and that those are probably going to have to change, unfortunately. And then Bassett arrives and continues to be a jerk. He's just fired Dawson's secretary. So Dawson leaves, and Bassett and, and Woodman have this conversation. He says he wanted he, he wants to start bridge sessions up Woodman and his wife again. And Woodman's like, well, my wife is dead. She committed suicide last year in Manila. And, oh, she left about the same time you did. There are a lot of implications here yeah which watching a lot of these it, it maybe surprises me a little that 1950s early 60s tv has so many references to infidelity yeah yeah i mean they were a little circumspect about this and they never really they don't really confirm that either no in this episode no there's a lot of unanswered questions in this episode and, and like what actually actually happened that two years yeah we never really learned that right but we're certainly establishing our list of suspects here yeah there's a lot of edge and ken is he's more quietly antagonistic but you can tell that there's a lot there that he's really upset with this guy and doesn't want to deal with him and because he's a physically imposing guy yeah certainly see that something could happen and so he leaves and then dawson returns and he's he's really steamed and bassett's just like well you're fired too yeah and so finally perry mason enters and we see that perry he's an all-purpose lawyer he can do contract work as well as defense lawyer yeah he's very versatile much like much like tv doctors or tv uh, scientists yeah <laughs> he's a generalist all kinds <laughs> that's right <laughs> Now, Dawson is in Mason's office, though. Yes. So Dawson has come to, to him and... To look at his contract. So his contract as president, they can't do anything about that, but his contract as general manager, which was his previous contract, is still good for another six months. And Dawson explains, you know, that his intention in all of this is legal and honorable. And then he says it again, like, it's really, he, he kind of makes himself seem suspect. He's, you understand what I'm saying. 
He seems a little too eager to prove his innocence. Yeah, his yeah, decency. His intentions and yeah. everything, yeah. So Mason has Della call Bassett, who is <laughs> indignant that Mason would suggest buying off Dawson's contract, and says no. Bassett accuses Dawson of stealing and wants Mason to come meet him later. And then we, we meet Arthur Colmar, who turns out to be the company controller. And he says they should be done in a few hours. So Mason's supposed to go there at 10 to meet him, 10 at night. That's keeping some long hours. Yeah. Goes to show you. M- Mason doesn't even blink an eye at, at like a 10 o'clock meeting for, right. for yeah. this case. <laughs> he'll, you know, he'll do some paperwork in between. I guess so, yeah. Maybe get a bite. Yeah. He'll be good. <laughs> So later we're in the office building and a woman screams. And then, you know, Mason doesn't hear this, but he walks in and he walks into the outer office. Richard is there. He's trying to revive Teddy, who seems to have fainted or passed out. And she wakes up and explains that she came to the office looking for Richard. She was worried he was going to do something to his stepfather. And a man ran out of the, the inner office and knocked her down. And she says she would know him in any place. So Mason goes into the inner office and turns on the light and there is Bassett. He's dead. He's been shot. He's clutching the piece of a toupee. Yes, very interesting. And I liked, it, it, there's an interesting moment here where Robert Redford, a.k.a. Dick Hart, kind of like, hey, what's that? You know, and he gives a look. Like, he, he really wants Perry to notice that, uh-huh. which I thought was interesting. Of course, also interesting is... He cackles. Yes, he's laughing hysterically <laughs> at finding out that he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> like, ah, somebody beat me to it. Yeah. <laughs> And then later we see Sybil on the phone telling Dawson the details, and then he, he's at home. And after the call, he's, he opens a cardboard box, and it's empty. And then he's searching through his drawer, and he looks in the mirror, and he rips off a toupee. Mm. Could he have done it? What do you think was in the box? Many questions as we go to commercial. Philip Ober is Peter Dawson, by the way. Veteran actor who was married to Vivian Vance for many years. His toupee is pretty good, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I didn't know he was the toupee person. I, exactly. Until, I didn't uh, think that either. It helps that all men in that era seem to have some sort of like pomade in their hair. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Hides the seams. And as, as we learn later, he has quite a good toupee. Right. So later, Dawson's at Mason's office, and he's explaining that he went for a long walk that night. He doesn't have an alibi, but that his extra toupee was stolen, and and that there are ways of identifying a toupee. Mm. And just then, Della and Trag enter, and Trag is, is gleeful to explain more of this to Mason, about how toupees can have all sorts of different colors in them, and strands and can be each individually identified and no two are alike no two are alike <laughs> and uh, although i guess you know if you had two of the same made two identical you could have two made for yourself that are alike right i guess yeah that's or right maybe but you'd still have different serial numbers on them <laughs> yes. i would assume yes each strand has yeah. <laughs> a serial number and you know mason reminds trag the, uh, of teddy and trag says that you know she vanished the night of the killing and he thinks mason is hidden her way and Mason's like now you've jumped to a conclusion and tracks them. naturally <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I know who I am <laughs> yeah it's what I do he arrests Dawson or at least takes him in for question mm-hmm. so now we have our client we have our killing we have our client we have our suspects yes and we have our decedent yes Good. And there's a scene at, at the office of the company, with brief scene with Paul Drake and, and Richard. I just enjoyed that. Two cool guys. Yeah. Scene together. Richard's explaining. The, and, and this is almost where he was the most uh, Luke Skywalker. He's like, yeah, I told you everything. Come on. Yeah. Gee whiz. Yeah. <laughs> So he leaves, and Paul explains that, you know, he'd only known Teddy about a week. And and then Colmar comes in and says that he left. He, he worked late, but left at 947, which he knows because he rides the bus, and he missed the bus. And he says that, that Dawson had barged in around 8 because he found out he was being accused of being a thief. He was angry about that. A lot of barging in in this episode. Yes. <laughs> And then Mason asks him if he knew about Dawson's toupee, and he gets really sheepish about it. Yeah, and he kind of runs his hand through his own hair. Yeah. Which is an interesting gesture. I was kind of thinking, does this guy have a toupee? Right. I was totally off balance in this episode with the toupees. Right. Anyone could have a toupee. Yeah. Perry Mason, God forbid, could have a toupee. (laughs) That's right. And he's like, well, I saw, one time I saw Ken kind of teasing him about it, trying to pull it off his head. Which, uh, you know, that interaction seems very long ago after what we've seen earlier in this episode. Yeah, I guess he can. Uh, no teasing involved, just ripping off his head. Yeah. Out of spite. Not friendly joshing. Uh, like like Elaine in that Seinfeld. Ripping yeah. George's <laughs> toupee off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then Perry goes to talk to a woodman at his home where he's eating lunch. He's got quite a lunch set up. <laughs> he Did does. Did you notice that? 
Yeah. I mean, I don't know if he made it himself. He just, he's, there's like a, it's, it's like if you were, at, I don't know, like Thanksgiving dinner or something. He's got the plate that he's eating on, uh-huh. but then there's like a plate of buns and a yeah. plate of meats. It's like a multi-course meal. Yeah. Like, and, you know, usually for lunch, I'm just popping something into the microwave and right. getting it out as fast as I can. Yeah. <laughs> I'm barely getting a plate most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> Let alone four or five of them. Right, yeah. And then he's got to wash all those. Yeah. He just seemed like kind of by the book and like committed to like ritual, you know, so I could see him like setting things out in a very deliberate way and eating them everything in exactly the same order each time. Right. And maybe they're like keeping them in the icebox or something in that. Yeah. Because that's what they had back then. Of course, yes. <laughs> you know, on those plates and just taking the plate out and serving it. You know, it, I, could, I could see it, but it, 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 it for one person, it looked a little funny. Right. He's probably a very methodical bridge player, too. Oh, yeah. You know, always goes for Trump after the third pass. I don't know anything about bridge. No, I don't either. <laughs> Everybody did back then, though. Yeah. You know, in the, in the 1960, if you were like a middle-aged couple, you better know how to play bridge if you want to have a social life, right? Yeah. I somehow want, I want to inject whist into this conversation. Ah, uh, whist, yes. <laughs> I know even less about whist. Yeah. Other than uh, Phineas Fogg played a lot, or not Phineas, Phileas. Not, not, the, not, not the Voyager's character. The, the Jules Verne yes. character <laughs> around the world? Yes, that, that played a lot of whist. Yes. On various forms of transportation. <laughs> But, uh, and I like, like Mason shows up with it. Well, I'm going to still eat my lunch. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And he's just like, nope, I'm not going to answer any questions. I'm not on the stand. Yeah. And uh, Mason kind of smiles at that, you know, and like, okay, that's how you want it. Right. He does offer that he thinks either Teddy or Richard did it. I like how he throws that that out there. I I really like this scene. I like the two of them were cool together and just Perry Mason's reactions were, were very funny. Yeah. He still has his wife stuff the way she left. Yeah, because Perry comments on the, like, I was led to believe you lived alone or something like that. The layout struck him as unusual as it did you, Mike. A little, little too much here for one man. Yeah, Perry asks two questions. That's two questions. Yeah, it's two questions, just one answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Then back at Perry's office, Paul explains that the police have found the gun. It was bought for the office, but registered to Dawson, and they found the shells at his home. And then Paul heads off to San Francisco to find out more about Teddy. Yeah. And that's cool. We get a scene of Paul doing legwork. Yeah, we get a couple of, like, cool scenes here. I, I like this, you know, getting to see, like you said, Paul doing the actual legwork, and we get to see some interesting actors in the next couple of scenes. Yeah. Are they ones you recognize? The dinner club or whatever where she, where Teddy worked. Hal Smith is the guy he talks to, and he was... Uh, uh, Otis on the Andy Griffith show and King of Cartoons, I think, on the Brady Bunch and a lot of cartoon voices. So it was it was cool. And and you know, they got a, a you know fairly notable character actor for a very short scene, which is interesting. Yeah. And he's working at the the Burgundy Club. And Paul learns there that she sang and played piano and had been was there about a month and then she just she met Richard and disappeared. But she left some stuff and in it Paul finds a matchbook for Flo's beauty salon in Fresno. So then he's at Flo's. She's no pushover. She's no pushover and she's also no Polly Holiday, I wanna uh, make clear. But she's played by an actress I looked her up, Rita Duncan, because she really stood out for me. I, I liked her this is kinda my, my favorite like small performance in the thing because she's a little sassy and just the way she interacts with Drake I really enjoyed and, and kind of found myself wishing there was more of her in this episode. Right. And he's like, you know, you're giving me the run around and she's sort of like whatever and then it's like sighs and gives her some money yeah <laughs> ducks it away in the cash register and she's like well i made a phone call <laughs> yeah <laughs> which really isn't that useful but this guy comes in and it is useful because he also was married to teddy under the name nikki and he has a picture and he was a rich guy and she kind of took him for a ride yes and part of the problem was they didn't have a picture of her yeah this fenwick guy he looks a little bit of a milk toast kind of type yes he does let me just put it this way that one would surmise that money would be the main factor in teddy being with him <laughs> Yeah. Is that fair to say? Yes. She's otherwise they might not have a lot in common. Right. Yeah, she's a, a young bleach blonde. She looks she looks more appropriate for Robert Redford. Yeah, she seems rather shallow herself. Yeah. But that that's turns out to be very important information. And that picture is important. So they they tell Richard about it and he can't believe it, but that's how it is. And they figure that Teddy took off to protect her secret. Because if the cops started talking to her, they would have found out things. And Richard had left the office and he comes back and says he was being followed and He's like, well, sure, the police think you're going to lead. Yeah. I'm going to tell you where Teddy is, and sh- you're going to lead them. Yeah, isn't he says something like, yeah, you've been followed, you're going to be, you're being followed, and you're going to be followed more or something. And he just, again, it's classic the way Perry says stuff. He just says it, like, so confidently and just matter-of-factly that I just laughed out loud with the way he said it. Like, he doesn't bat an eye at, at all, and he just, like, lays it out to him, like, yeah, that, that's the case, and here's what's going to happen. And then as he's saying it, he also is like, oh, maybe you will. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave them to her. Yes. And then here we get into some the beginnings of some Perry Mason shenanigans. We get another scene and there's this there's a woman who's got bleach blonde hair and looks a lot like Teddy. Mm-hmm. And he's going to send her to Carmel by the sea. Is one of his favorite vacation spots. Oh, lovely place, yes. Yes. <laughs> I can't imagine Perry taking a long vacation to Carmel by the sea, but I guess he does. I'll take him at his word. Visit his friend Clint. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And this is where she's she's like, you know, you have a reputation for skirting law. Yeah, that was kind of interesting. Yeah. And he, he assures her that nothing illegal is happening. He responds, I also like to break the law with skirts, if you know what I mean. <laughs> no, he doesn't say that. He just says, he just reassures her. And, you know, again, he's, he's, he's a little bemused by her saying that. But that, that's interesting. I, I don't, I haven't seen that come up a lot in the show. Like with, like from the, the law enforcement, it's one thing kind of accusing Perry of playing tricks on them. But to have like an actual like civilian kind of just say that to him, it, it, it stood out to me. Yeah, like his, his sort of notoriety comes up or his fame. Yeah. But yeah. Not his tactics. Right. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a little, that was interesting to me. Regular Joes have opinions about him. Yeah. They're sitting around, oh no, that Perry Mason, he likes to skirt the law. Yeah. <laughs> But it is kind of interesting, though, and it's kind of realistic in the sense that it's kind of a weird thing they're asking her to do. And it's it's a nice touch that they have her ask a question and kind of like she also says that because she needs reassurance, you know, that, hey, this isn't. You know, what, what exactly is going on here? And he doesn't really tell her exactly what he's doing. No. Again, a common theme of the episode. And actually, before the scene ends, yeah. Della asks. Right. <laughs> like, hey, are you going to tell me what's going on here? What does this mean? It means that the preliminary hearing begins tomorrow. Right. That's not an answer. That, that, that's what? <laughs> That's how it ends. That scene, you know. So again, it's like you've heard of mansplaining. It's like man no splaining in this episode. <laughs> they don't even bother. It's it's kind of funny, like all this stuff, you know. Like you'll find out later. Yeah. Now he mu- he must because then she's part of the. Yeah. Eventually she realizes it, but Perry just couldn't resist uh, getting in that that funny line about the preliminary hearing. Uh, maybe but... maybe he's compartmentalizing. Like no two people can know all the plan. Yeah. <laughs> then if they get captured. That's right. <laughs> it's protect legally protecting them too. Ah uh, yes, Perry. He's, he's smarter than I am. I, I should have known that. Yeah. He knows all the angles. But as, as you said, the preliminary hearing is starting. Now, I posed this question to you, and then I didn't bother trying to find the answer, but I think you maybe it came up in the, the book a little bit. Like most Perry Mason episodes, the courtroom things are these preliminary hearings that don't involve the jury, but they have all the courtroom, the witnesses and the evidence. and Yeah. I, it's very confusing. I think that's something that might maybe startle a viewer who is familiar with the, the show existing but hasn't actually seen a bunch of episodes like me for example yeah because when i got into this i was kind of surprised like hey yeah they never like actually have jury trials on the show it's or it's rare and yes i think their main source for this was uh, arthur marks uh, one of the show's producers who i mentioned gave like some extensive comments on that 50th anniversary dvd package and i think he explained for one thing they thought it was more realistic earl stanley gardner was was kind of on board with this that it would be unrealistic to have everybody sit through a preliminary hearing with an innocent guy and then go through and then you know perry would do his best to prevent a trial from even happening so you might as well just dispense of it then and you can do a lot of the same legalities you know there and then i guess arthur mark said something else and this kind of made me think this is probably the real reason simply if you had like a jury you'd have to have 12 more extras and you just do uh, lead to an elaborate thing let alone having like two different courtroom things per episode so part of it was legal but maybe a big part of it was also practical yeah i just like all of that makes sense i'm just like what are there preliminary hearings where this kind of stuff happens like on law and order it's just like they plead yeah, it's more routine. Yes, and then, and then maybe, well, sometimes there are multiple ones to see if they can get bail or, you know, those kind of things, but they, they're not presenting evidence usually. Right. These are like multi-day affairs, these preliminary hearings with like recesses and, and witnesses and, and right. evidence and all the rules of like an actual courtroom trial. Yeah, and it seems like all this stuff is going to be done again when yeah. they're in front of the jury. But may, and maybe it's a California thing. I, I'm just thinking out loud, maybe like if a defense lawyer wasn't lucky enough to be always defending innocent people, maybe he would save a lot of his stuff for the jury and, and not you know want to reveal it because he knew he would know that they would go to trial anyway so maybe that's a way may, having a short preliminary hearing might be a way to kind of avoid revealing all your case maybe for both sides whereas in this situation they're both so like confident that they're going to win that they just go for it all in this this phase of it i don't know maybe one of our many the, the many legal minds that uh, listen to our podcast maybe uh, a lawyer of the show could oh that's right our consigliari yes our consigliari yes could <laughs> pipe in and explain this to us like our <laughs> Or maybe it's yeah something that they don't do anymore. Yeah. They've streamlined. Because it really does seem like they might be holding the trial twice. Yeah. It's interesting because they're they're playing to the judge and not the jury. Uh, you know, with so they're, they're playing to the judge more about matters of procedure and, and nuances of the law. And I guess maybe that's the approach that, like, Gardner liked. He's like, he's not into that, you know, that showy... <laughs> 
closing arguments and all that. He's into like arcane nuances of the law. That's true. They, they never really do the opening and closing argument thing. Yeah, they just go like, we usually go pretty much in the middle of it, in fact. And in this case, uh, Berger is he's questioning Richard and pretty much just relates the stuff we've heard. The only interesting thing is here is that he has to invoke some sort of legal... Rest just day, I believe it is, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that because she's absent, Teddy's absent, that they can hearsay can be admissible. Yeah, you know, I didn't quite under. Well, I, I they did explain it well, and I, I didn't had no idea what that legal term was, but I love it when they throw this out in Perry Mason. And actually, in general, the courtroom is my favorite section of each episode. I can see. I, I love the courtroom scenes are, are my favorite for for many reasons, almost all of which are evident in this particular episode. And and this particular scene or our moment, the judges. Do you have any objections, Mr. Mason? And he sort of like smirks. You know, I have no objection. Yeah. <laughs> He's playing right into my yeah. <laughs> trap somehow. He does a lot of things where he'll like sort of look away like for a moment and he, like ever so slight and so- pauses he'll do like before he like for really no reason other than it just seems like for his own amusement that he sort of just doesn't do things right away. It, it's really cool to watch. I mean. And he seems just amused that Berger is going to so much trouble here. Yeah. And you know what's awesome? It's something else interesting I, I found out. And I'm I'm not sure, but probably by the time of this episode, actually, Raymond Burr relied heavily on cue cards. Huh. Like the first season, they did 39 episodes, I think, the first season. And he was, you know, in so many of the scenes, it was a huge toll on him to learn the dialogue. And he sort of suggested this. But I think multiple people said that he was great at it. Like you could never tell. Like he, he was had a, a certain way of, of reading them masterfully. And the only time like there was ever any like remote trouble with it was sometimes like there were certain like over the, the shoulder shots they didn't really care for as much because the cue cards would be farther away so it'd be a little bit harder for him to see them but he didn't cause a problem with anything they, they were able to like seamlessly integrate that into the process and everybody was fine with it so i thought that was really interesting i never would have guessed that no and you know probably it's a little bit like having printing out directions somewhere you sort of read them over yeah. you have them like it's a you know it's there to help you but you right. might not actually be reading them sometimes he wasn't like bob hope uh reading the cue cards boy <laughs> Bob Hope in a legal drama. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> he would be playing to the jury. Yes, he would. <laughs> Get a load of this guy. <laughs> so we don't really learn too much there, but it was fun. Yeah. And then Berger's implying that Mason hid Teddy somewhere, and then he's talking to Trag, and those are always fun, too, because Trag is he's showing evidence to Trag. Trag you know, yes, this has my mark, but he explains that they found the gun in a culvert, and uh, yeah, that there was evidence of a struggle at the scene, and... and and Mason, they have a nice little exchange about guns and culverts. And yeah. There's a track. Well, it was in a, par- a culvert in a park about halfway between the office and the <laughs> yeah. defendant's home. And, yeah. and Mason's like, that seems a little too convenient, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, he says like, isn't it true? Like he rattles off some statistic about like police finding guns in culverts, and Trag's like, well, that's because criminals find them convenient places to hide guns or something like that. <laughs> and then he gives that geographical uh, little note, and Perry's like, thank you for adding that information. <laughs> <laughs> You got to see the, the, like this exchange, but this is the kind of thing was why I love these courtroom scenes is because it's just it's just so much fun uh, you know watching especially when you see like you know confident actors just going back and forth and it, it seems natural even though on the one hand it's like you know this is kind of a murder case should it really be this you know kind of funny but it is <laughs> yeah and then so Richard leaves the courtroom and then we get Roderick the toupee expert the man who made the toupee yeah we could have used Stanley in some past seasons of the podcast I think to to give us some definitive yes. answers on some celebrity heads of hair we've speculated yeah, on. yeah. and th- this guy is very entertaining he is yeah he's like i mean the actor's entertaining but the character's written is like way into his job <laughs> yeah well you know Lori made the point she said something that was probably very true she said this guy probably doesn't get a lot of chances to testify like this no so <laughs> he's taking every moment he can and really making the most out of it yeah i love he's got so he's got the head model that they used for Dawson's head. Mm. And at one point, Berker hands him the piece of evidence. And he's like, hey, and, and that'll fit in, in a particular spot on the head. And it's like, oh, yes, it will. <laughs> <laughs> he's putting it there. And then the best part is he's explaining that the hairline is like a fingerprint. It's like every hairline is unique. And it's like a shoreline with infinite and varied juttings and inlets. <laughs> <laughs> and Berger's, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you know Mason is questioning him, and he asks if someone could pull off a toupee without ripping it into pieces. And the Roderick explains it's entirely possible if if properly attached with spirit gum. And then he's like, "If you'd like to test, Mister Mason, grab away." Yeah. <laughs> 
the whole courtroom bursts yeah. into laughter. And I like the judge kind of bangs the gavel, like, okay, enough. You know, yeah, like, he doesn't even have a gavel. He's just using his, like, his pen. Yeah, yeah. But it's almost like it's really just a brief moment of levity, but I like how the judge instantly maintains control. Yeah. <laughs> But it was it was uh, pretty funny though. And who knew? I didn't know all this about Dupes. No, no, it was very enlightening. Testimony. Certainly, I didn't know that the hairline was like a shoreline with infinite and very juttings and inlets. Yeah, that was a new one on me too. <laughs> <laughs> why, why don't we see that more in CSI type yeah. shows? <laughs> Oh, we identified him by his hairline. Yeah, they should have a hairline expert on the team. Right. You know, that's the first thing he does is... This guy. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, let me see. He's been burned beyond all recognition, except for his hairline. Yes. You know, is is it true that after this episode for a couple of years, the, the whole legal system was upended because juries demanded hairline evidence, you know, and they wouldn't convict anybody. And if, if there wasn't hairline evidence, they, they didn't see anybody as guilty. Yeah. Isn't that where the term a hairline crack comes from? Yes, exactly. It's a hairline crack in the case. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Right. And then Berger was talking to Arthur Colmar, and he shows him a photostat of the books with the missing $6,000. And Colmar explains that there was no investigation at the time that it disappeared because Dawson asked to hush it up because the, the company had been, you know, was in difficult times. He also explains that at the time they were using cash to pay their employees, and so they had a bunch of cash in the vault. Talk about shady. Yes. And only f- he, Dawson, Sybil, and Woodman had access to the vault. He definitely seems to be throwing shade in Dawson's direction. He does. Now, he's got very detailed, just about every scene, he's got detailed answers for everything. Yes. Mm. He seems like a meticulous man. He's slightly hot, too. Mm-hmm. I, I thought that myself. Of course, I thought that about half the characters in this episode. But. <laughs> yes. And there's a quick scene of Paul dropping Richard off at the airport. Yeah, that was kind of interesting. And talk about bygone days, you know, just like you mentioned at the beginning, Pan Am Airlines. Yeah. That kind of dates this, like, in a, in a good way for me, too. Yeah. And, and just pulling right up to the airport like that. Yeah. yeah that's right. Yeah. And like telling them, hey, you gotta, you know, they're they're pushing it as far as catching the flight. You right. Know? Yeah. Your flight's leaving in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go on, beat it. Yeah. I gotta go get lunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, back in the courtroom, Woodman said that he overheard two conversations with Bassett and says in one of them that Dawson threatened him. We didn't see that conversation. And then, you know, Mason asks him about his wife and, and reveals that he went to Manila to kill Bassett. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But he wasn't there. Yeah. So, and, and now he's sort of like, well, killing isn't the only way. Yeah, it's the best way to deal with things, but not the only way. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and I found that the staging of this scene very interesting because Perry like starts off like facing him and then he kind of goes beside him while he's talking to him and, and then kind of circles back around him. And just like it's just interesting, like the body language and, and, you know, just the way Perry asked the questions I found fascinating. He's using all his tools. He is. Yes. And it, it, it makes, I think, a fairly static scene, like visually very interesting. Yeah. I'm sure Raymond Burr was conscious of that. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of visually interesting, one thing we haven't, it, this might be a good uh, time to interject here with one of the, the hallmarks of Perry Mason is the frequent cuts to close-ups of possibly guilty parties <laughs> or involved parties sitting in the courtroom. Yeah. You know, I love that. And they always have some kind of tense, like, troubled look in their face, you know. It kind of reminds you of all the people involved and who the suspects are. Yeah. Sometimes they're sweating. Yeah. Yeah. They do little bits of business sometimes. Yeah. And then Berger calls Sybil to the stand, but the judge calls for a recess. And in Carmel, we see Richard arrive at a hotel where he meets fake Teddy and L- Lorna is her real name and then the the police take them in back in the courtroom Berger asked Sybil about this note she received from Bassett and she's sort of like well you know I don't know but I want to say too one of my favorite pieces of evidence in Perry Mason is the photo stat yes the photo stat they make frequent use of the photostat, and I, I always like that, too. Yes, in this case, he has a photostat. They found impressions. That's a good one, too. Yeah. Ballpoint pen impressions on a notepad. Yes. And they're able to use that and recreate it. You make a photostat of the note. <laughs> How many big cases have been turned because somebody didn't realize that they'd leave impressions on a pad? Always use a felt-tip pen. <laughs> yeah. Excellent advice, Mike. Excellent. You know, the note said things we've heard before that he thinks Dawson was a thief, and it turns out she called Dawson and told him about it. Certainly maybe points in his direction again but then trag comes in and and whispers to Berger, and it turns out it's about fake teddy and Berger wants a recess until she arrives at the airport and and then in the hallway we see colmar and woodman share a unpleasant conversation (laughs) pleasant on one side and not pleasant on the other yeah colmar asks him if he wants to go out for coffee yeah which is kind of unusual yeah i think one or both of them is light or lighting up cigarettes but they, they go their separate ways and then paul follows woodman and Della follows Colmar, and Trag follows her. You know, that's an interesting, intricate, I, I didn't notice that nuance that, that Trag was following her. Yeah. I, I didn't I didn't catch that at first. I'm glad you, you pointed that I out. I hope he sent someone 
after Paul because he, yeah, I, I don't. It doesn't seem like Perry necessarily knows the full answer. He knows this situation might lead to the killer, right? But it does depend on cops following both of them, right? Because if if the killer is the one Paul followed, someone's got to be there, <laughs> right? Well, when we were watching, Laurie was kind of joking about like the amount of resources that this scheme requires, and I said, well, at least Trag didn't use too many police re- resources because he took Della with him right. <laughs> instead of uh, using taking an actual cop because it looks like you know like the two of them are teaming up on this when they go get him right yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh, meanwhile there's also a scene in the judge's chambers because of course Berger is outraged by all of this and you know and Perry <laughs> very calm and smug about it. well you know it's the only way he's going to find the killer and, and Berger has one of his more p- pitiful statements here because he said he's kind of whining to the judge he's like well I've already got like I forget he says iron clatter airtight case that you know Dawson's the killer you know he's like why are we doing this and he, he seems like he's about to cry yeah <laughs> It's kind of sad, really. But the judge, and, and this, you know, some judges are kind of like, well, I don't want to, this better not be whatever, a fishing expedition, that kind of stuff. But this judge is just like, oh, yeah, I, I see. So the real killer will probably go to try to stop her, mm-hmm. find him that way. That's what happens, and, and it turns out it was Colmar. So Della and Trag stop him at the airport right after he buys a ticket. That's kind of hard. Couldn't they have stopped him before he bought the ticket? Yeah, exactly. And I guess he was just going to get out of town, but, or he's... It's kind of an odd thing, little detail that he asked uh, Ken out for coffee if he was planning on jumping town. You know, I guess, I guess maybe it was just a hollow gesture or whatever. He knew that he wasn't going to say yes. He's been down that road before. (laughs) And, and, and then we get like a wrap up scene, which those are always fun too. It's always good because there, there, many times in these stories, there is like multiple things that, that we could be asking, you know, like that we don't know. And usually it's Paul. Yeah. <laughs> We're being a good investigator. Yeah. He's always, wait, but what happened? Yeah. One thing still bothers me, Perry. <laughs> Why did he kill him? Yeah. So it turns out Della explains all this. that He was the thief and Bassett, when they were going over the books, figured it out. And so he killed him and he framed Dawson and, and then Trag enters and <laughs> says that they, that because of they had that photo, they were able to send it out and. They found Teddy in Vermont, and he said, guess what she was doing? And he and Della both say the same thing. Getting married again. Yes. <laughs> they have a good time. Uh... Yeah, and Perry does like a take to the yeah. camera. Yeah, almost. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah. And I think, isn't this the scene where uh, Tr- when Treg walks in, Perry says, well, we weren't speaking of the devil, but, yes. <laughs> but here you are. <laughs> yeah. And Treg kind of like it sh- shakes that off. And Yeah. It's it's a pretty good example of like the team aspect of it though that that Perry sort of gives Della that bit of exposition and that the show gives Barbara Hale that bit of exposition. Yeah, you know it it gives somebody else uh, some lines and something to do and also reinforces what a vital character Della is. So it's another nice little touch they put in there. Yeah, and I more than one episode ends with Trag there with them laughing. Yeah, about something. Yeah, it's it's funny for all the the back and forth they do before the trial. Like all is forgiven at the end. You know they they can all kick back and have a good good laugh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's just funny too because just the fact that like Trag likes to go in and update them on what happened you know like instead instead of just like calling them or letting them find out he goes out of his way to go in and tell them so they because he knows that they'll get a kick out of it right yeah <laughs> <laughs> I mean it, it's funny because you, you can tell he, he likes hanging out with them a lot more than he likes hanging out with Hamilton <laughs> well <laughs> understandable yeah <laughs> That's the case of the treacherous toupee. Frankly, the toupee really was not treacherous. No. It was, I guess it was treacherous to Dawson. Yeah, but it wasn't like the toupee was actively involved in the case or no. conspiring or involved in the, the missing money or anything like that. It certainly didn't kill anyone. No. <laughs> A fine episode, though. Yes. I, I really enjoyed it. Not everything was, was resolved, but that, that's kind of cool. Like, I just, just think it's funny that we don't know what happened those missing two years. But legally, and as far as, like, the, the murder case itself, everything was wrapped up to my satisfaction. Yes, mine too. We said well-acted, well-written, well-directed. Yeah, good stars by, you know, some, some actors I did recognize, some I didn't. Cool to see Robert Redford in a very early role. And just a lot of fun. It, it really delivers pretty much all I want from a Perry Mason episode, and it's and, and that way it's indicative of what you get from from Perry Mason and if there's people you know that listening that, that maybe don't have a lot of experience with 50s and 60s uh, TV I, I really recommend that they give uh, Perry Mason a shot yeah and if you like one you're gonna like many of them yes <laughs> if you don't like one you're probably not gonna like any of them yeah I've also found that it, it's a, a show that's easy to watch in pieces like not on one setting necessarily. yeah yeah gotcha I think because it's kind of segmented out yes. and different things you can kind of watch up to the killing or something and later come back to the, the Perry parts yeah there's something really reassuring and the formula is is pleasant I, I can see why it's popular on me tv even in like butchered form and there's just so many episodes so many different plots and 
just a lot of a lot of interesting stuff going on and I, I think it's a great blend of police work and investigative work and the the courtroom drama where you know they really get me in there but and all anchored by you know Raymond Burr doing a, a great ongoing performance one of the best characters in TV history I would say all right well if you have any legal opinions you'd like to share with us yes <laughs> you can get in touch with us at, at our website, battleofthenetworkshows.com. Our email, mailbag at battleofthenetworkshows.com. Yes, we've had to suspend our snail mail address because of a request from the post office. Yeah, uh, yeah that's right. <laughs> but uh, yes, that's the, the quickest way to, to get a hold of us directly through that email address. Or you can visit us on our Facebook group, right? Just go to Facebook, search Battle of the Network Shows, and very easy to join the group. I think there's a, a few basic questions we ask you uh, to answer, but it's not like we're grilling you on the stand or anything like that. And they're not legally binding. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you won't need to hire Perry Mason if we find out that you prefer low and brow over steak. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and I'd love to hear what people think about this episode and this series in general. And have you watched the new Perry Mason? And I don't mean the HBO one, although that's fair game too, but specifically the 1973 new Perry Mason. Does anybody remember that? I certainly don't. Are you trying to forget it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and wh- what are your favorite episodes of Perry Mason? Because uh, like I said, with, with 270 episodes, there's a, there's a lot to choose from. And if anybody has any good recommendations or something that stands out, but just trying to give away the name of the killer. The one thing about the book I mentioned, The Case of the Illiter- Alliterative Attorney, is there's a comprehensive episode guide, but they take pains to not reveal the killer's identity. In most cases, I think there's a few cases where they'll make references, but they, they generally go no spoilers as far as that goes. That's cool. So you can kind of read through and without spoiling the conclusions. And, you know, have you ever objected to anything because it was incompetent, irrelevant, and immaterial? <laughs> if not. Me neither, but uh, if, if anyone out there has. Uh, I, I want to. <laughs> That didn't happen in this episode either, but that's a it didn't. favorite objection. And, and that's that's one of my favorites, yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get to the point where I'm watching these Perry Masons where I, I, I like to anticipate the objection <laughs> and like the language they use. Yeah. And that's usually a, a pretty safe bet that that's, that's going to come up. Yeah, it didn't in this one, but that's a good go-to if you, if you want to object to something. Yes. <laughs> okay, that closes the case of the treacherous toupee. This episode brought to you by Roderick's Toupees of Los Angeles. Grab away. This episode also brought to you by Paul Drake Detective Agency. Cool, calm, a little exasperated, and a lot hungry. This episode also brought to you by the law firm of incompetent, irrelevant, and immaterial. We give Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe a run for their money. Join us next time for another exciting episode of Battle of the Network Shows. Learn more, leave feedback, and suggest future episodes at battleofthenetworkshows.com. Follow us on Twitter at Batnet Shows and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Battle of the Network Shows.